What's going on guys? My name is Steve. Thank you for stopping by my channel. Today we're going to be reacting to Plague Village. How Ian sacrificed itself to save others. I've seen this video recommended quite a bit in the comment section. And while I don't really understand exactly what this video is about, I think the title gives me a pretty good idea of what I can expect in this video. And I think this is going to be a topic that I probably find quite interesting. I've really been wanting to explore the bubonic plague for some time now. I obviously learned a little bit about it in school back in the day, but I don't really remember much about it. And I think the plague they're talking about here is probably the bubonic plague, but I'm not 100% certain. But anyway, either way, this video should be pretty interesting. So let's go ahead and check out the plague village, how EM sacrificed itself to save others. The peaceful village of Eam, tucked into the Peak District toward the north of England, and just 56 kilometers, 35 miles southeast of Manchester, is very much your quintessential English village, where aged cottages line the quiet streets with more than a man, whisper. It looks so of peaceful, man. I love here. little villages like it's that. It's one of these modest, out of the way places with a population of just a thousand people, where wow. you'd be forgiven for assuming that nothing of importance ever happens. And. You'd be entirely wrong. When the Great Plague of London erupted in 1665, some 250 kilometers south of Eam, for those living far from distant cities and still several centuries away from rolling news coverage, it must have seemed like a different world. London was ravaged by the last major outbreak of the bubonic plague in the UK, with at least 100,000 people dying as a result, a quarter of the city's population. But the a quarter of the population of London? Wow. That really puts into, into perspective of how massive that plague was. I mean, it really does. You know, I probably learned quite a bit about that when I was in school. I do remember a little bit, but like I said, I don't really remember much about that stuff. Uh, so I'm definitely looking forward to exploring the plague on a deeper level pretty soon. The country was not yet the vast interconnected web that we see today, and much of Britain was spared the horror. However, not everywhere was so lucky, and there were sporadic outbreaks in small villages and towns close to London, and even further afield. In 1665, a bundle of cloth arrived in Eam from London, destined for the local tailor, Alexander Hadfield. Unbeknown to everybody, the plague had arrived in the small village. What came next has gone down in the annals of heroism, with Eam's population choosing to implement a voluntary quarantine to prevent the disease from spreading to nearby communities. Over 14 months, the plague devastated Eam, reducing its already tiny population. The story of Eam... Wow. So they literally said, we're going to stop this in this tract right here. We're not going to go anywhere else. We're going to keep this here and lock it down. Wow, man. That's crazy, man. simply referred to as Plague Village remains an astonishing tale of self-sacrifice in the face of one of the worst diseases that we've ever experienced. In many ways, wow. Eam hasn't changed much over the centuries. Its church stands much as it did 350 years ago, and many older buildings have been preserved in that quaint way that often tends to happen in English villages. Whether it was the Romans or the Anglo-Saxons who first settled here is open for debate, but both left a presence in the local area. Lead mining was once a lucrative business in this northern region of England, and it continued up until the 19th century when better and cheaper alternatives were found. In 1665, the village was about as anonymous as it gets, just another English village in the north of the country, close to the quickly growing city of Manchester, but it was still a world away from the frantic hustle and bustle of London to the south. Yet while this small village may have been relatively peaceful and tranquil, there were some political and religious undercurrents that we should go through before we carry on with today's so I think it was, what, 160 miles from London is where Eames, I think that's what it said. Um, and is it Eames or Eames? I, I, I don't know. Um, but I'm sure sitting here trying to think how long that would have took, how long of a journey would that have been on horse and, you know, horse and buggy or just by horseback? I mean, what would that be? Probably, I don't know, would that be five days? A week journey? I don't know. That'd be quite a while. I mean... I wonder how fast they could go. Well, no, it wouldn't be that long. Probably like two or three days. I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Let's continue. Story. 
Just over a year before the outbreak, Reverend Thomas Stanley had been dismissed from his official post for refusing to take the oath of conformity and use the common book of prayer. This was a series of reforms that had come into effect with the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. Stanley had firmly objected to the more authoritarian undertones of the oath of conformity and was replaced by Reverend William Mompesson, who had been in the post just a year and now lived in the rectory with his wife Catherine and their two small children. Stanley, on the other hand, had been banished to a house on the outskirts of the village, but remained a deeply popular figure among his ex-parishioners. The same can't be said for the unfortunate Montpesson, who seems to have landed a rather poisoned chalice. Villagers remained suspicious of him, and it was clear where their allegiances really lay. When the play, uh, I'm trying to read that. I'm not sure if the stuff he's got wrote there is stuff he's going to cover, or oh wait, that's okay. That's the same thing. First free London in 1664 is by no means the first time had visited the country. Recent evidence suggests that the plague may have been Britain as early as 544 AD. Wow, didn't know that. When the plague burst free in London in 1664, it was by no means the first time that this hellish spectre had visited the country. Recent evidence suggests that the plague may have killed in Britain as early as 544 AD, though it's not entirely clear just how widespread that outbreak was. However, there is no such confusion about what happened just over 800 years later. In June 1348, a young sailor stepped ashore at Weymouth on England's south coast after making the short journey from Gascony on France's Atlantic. Atlantic seaboard. He would shortly become the first known plague victim in Britain during a pandemic that not only ravaged the British Isles, but much of Europe as well as Northern Africa and the Middle East. The wow. numbers killed during the Black Death, or the Great Mortality as it was then known, were astonishingly Great high mortality. at a time when medical understanding of pathology was still essentially in its infancy. Between 75 and 200 million people died as a result of the Black Death wow. between 1346 and 1353, with approximately Wow. That is insane. I mean, if we were to put that population or bring that same percentage of population of death to today's world, I mean, what would that be? I mean, would we, we would be talking over a billion people, I'm guessing. I don't even know. But wow, that is crazy, dude. Man. 40 to 60% of the British population dying perhaps around three to four wow. million people. The plague returned to Britain with a vengeance in 1361 and 1362, killing another 20% of the population before again petering out. But the events of the second half of the 14th century, it was simply the start. What is now labeled as the second plague pandemic was a multi-century period that stretched from the 14th century up to the early 19th century. There were further large-scale outbreaks in Britain in 1563, 1593, and 1625, but the plague never really left, and it was uncommon for any year to go past without at least some deaths attributed to it. London saw over 30,000 plague deaths in 1603, 35,000 in 1625, and 10,000 in 1636, but again, something much, much bigger. It was just lurking on the horizon. What has come to be known as the Great Plague of London was a slow burner at first. It's thought that this variation may have been carried over from the Netherlands, where Amsterdam had seen roughly 50,000 die from plague that year. The disease began creeping through the dock areas in London throughout the final months of 1664, but deaths were frequently attributed to something else. By April 1665, the number of deaths had increased and the city council acted to introduce household quarantine as a way of stemming the spread. By May and June, with the plague deaths mounting, panic set in. The rich were often able to flee the city to private houses in the country, while the poor either had to survive the best they could or attempt to leave the city, something that became increasingly difficult when regulations were introduced that required anybody leaving London to be in possession of a clean health certificate. As the summer progressed, deaths climbed steadily, moving from 2,000 per week in July to over 7,000 per week in September. The Whoa. city was left a painful shell of its former self, with abandoned businesses and deserted streets now a regular sight. Believing that animals might be the cause, the city ordered the culling of dogs and cats, while okay. another theory that it was down to bad air led to giant bonfires appearing that were required to be kept going day and night. 
While London received the worst of the outbreak, this was almost certainly down to its size and population density. Outside of the capital, deaths were certainly lower, but small pockets still received an absolutely hellish battering. Derby and Norwich were both hit hard, while there were also cases of tiny villages near major towns that had been effectively emptied thanks to the plague. The story goes that the plague arrived in the peaceful village of Eam within a bundle of cloth that had been sent from London to Alexander Hadfield, the local. So it came in on a bundle of cloth? That's cr man, that's crazy. Taylor. When his assistant, a man by the name of George Vickers, who also lived in the family home along with Hadfield, his wife and their two children, noticed that the cloth was damp, he made the fateful yet entirely practical decision to hang it out to dry. Within a matter of days, Vickers had become seriously ill and he died on the 7th of September 1665, becoming the first plague victim in Eam. Two weeks later, four-year-old Edward died and he was followed by his brother, Jonathan, a further two weeks later. Wow. Hadfield, whose unfortunate purchase from London had brought the plague to Eam, died the following August in 1666, leaving his wife, Mary, the only survivor. Today, a sign recalling the death stands beside the cottage where it all began. It blocked capitals at the top. It simply reads, Plague Cottage. Plague Cottage, wow. Between September and December 1664, 42 villagers died, and as 1665 began, then slowly progressed, panic gradually increased, and many openly considered fleeing the small village. By the spring, it was clear that Eam had reached a tipping point, and Reverend Montpesson began to contemplate a plan that would almost certainly kill many in Eam, but just might save nearby towns and villages. Now, at this point, it's important to remember that Reverend Montpesson was relatively new to the job in Eam, and he remained unpopular, though probably more because his parishioners remained loyal to his ousted predecessor, who many believe had been unfairly dismissed, rather than a genuine dislike for Montpesson himself. Montpesson couldn't have been in a worse position, and if he had any hope of convincing those in Eam of his plan, he needed support. And there was only one man who could help. Not much has been recorded about the relationship between Montpesson and Stanley, his predecessor. It seems likely that Stanley must have felt a degree of resentment in Makes how sense. he had been treated by the mm -hmm. church. But whether this extended to his successor, we just can't be sure. The two men agreed to meet, and together they concocted a plan that would place Eam into self-imposed quarantine with nobody allowed in or out of the village. Villagers nearby had agreed to leave food on the outskirts of Eam, and it was decided that money would be left in holes containing vinegar, a substance believed to ward off the plague. Now all the two reverends, both past and present needed, was the agreement of those living within the proposed cordon sanitaire. The meeting of all Eam inhabitants was called, and Montpesson, with Stanley standing beside him, set out the plan for how the village could combat the outbreak. First, boundary stones would be laid around Eam, with none of the inhabitants allowed to pass through, while signs would also be erected warning outside as not to enter the quarantine zone. Secondly, all food and materials needed from outside would be left at the boundary, as with the money required. Thirdly, the church would be locked and all services would be held outside. And finally, and perhaps most gruesomely of all, the dead would have to be buried by their families as close as possible to where they died instead of the church graveyard. Whoa. We can only begin to imagine what must have been going through the minds of the Eam villagers as this plan was laid out yeah. for them. The <laughs> reverends were requesting the highest of sacrifices on their part in the hope wow. that they might be able to save their neighboring villages. It's not clear how unanimous the decision was, but the majority agreed to the plan and Eam soon found itself in self-imposed lockdown. If there was a great nobility to the decision to quarantine the village. What came next was harrowing, as the overwhelming majority remained inside the cordon as the summer temperatures climbed along with deaths. There were odd reports of people leaving the village, either fleeing or simply going to a market in a bigger town, but the compliance rate was said to be high. That summer was exceptionally warm, and at its peak, four or five villages were dying every single day. Any resemblance of normality soon collapsed, and Eam began to crumble. Crops were left abandoned in the fields, with precious few people left to work them, while gardens, wow. roads, and even houses were left to decay. When the village's only stonemason succumbed to the disease, those who had lost loved ones were forced to engrave markers themselves, some of which still stand in Eam to this day. It wasn't uncommon for entire families to be decimated, and the story of Elizabeth Hancock is about as difficult a tale as you're ever likely to hear. Over the course of just eight days, Hancock lost her five children and her husband. After oh, each death, man. she would haul the body to a small plot on the outskirts of the village and bury it herself 
The plot still exists today, surrounded by a low stone wall with sweeping views of the countryside. A small plaque contains the names of those lost and the tragic timeline that accompanied their deaths. It reads, Elizabeth Hancock, August 3rd, 1666. John Hancock, August 3rd, 1666. Erna Hancock, August 7th, 1666. William Hancock, August 7th, 1666. Alice Hancock, August 9th, 1666. Anne Hancock, August 10th, 1666. Wow. The case of Elizabeth Hancock may have been one of the most difficult because of the sheer number of deaths in such a small amount of time, but it wasn't isolated. Across Eam, families were destroyed, and it became all too common to hear the slow dragging of a corpse on its way to a lonely burial. The summer proved to be the low point, and as autumn slowly progressed, there were glimmers that the outbreak was coming to an end. By November, deaths in Eam had ceased, and the decision was made to remove the quarantine. The plague had ravaged Eam for 14 months, with roughly nine months in self-imposed lockdown. Wow. As the air began to clear, the true horror of what had happened became apparent. Now, the number of deaths in Eam has been debated. Originally, the figure was put at 260 out of 350 inhabitants, but more modern research appears to suggest higher numbers for both, perhaps 400 survivors out of a population of 800. Whether it's the former or the... All the thousand, popu the thousand people population is today's population, not then. Okay, because I was thinking a thousand people, 200, that's still high, but wow, that's, that's crazy, dude. The latter, what happened in Eam meant that the tiny Derbyshire village saw higher rates of death than even London. But quite remarkably, the quarantine not only held, but it actually worked. Nearby towns and villages remained plague-free, which would have almost certainly been down to the actions of those living wow, in Eam. The effect on the small village was shattering, and it would have taken decades and perhaps even the best part of a century to fully recover. Reverend Montpesson's wife, Catherine, is buried in the local cemetery with flowers often left at her grave into this day in memory of her sacrifice to remain with her husband in Eam, even as their two children left. The events in Eam, now just over 350 years ago, have been retold countless times in the last couple of years as we battle our own pandemic and perhaps search parallels between our own experience and that of the past. While quarantines have been used long before Eam, there were few, if any, examples of self-imposed quarantines. The successful implementation in Eam showed that it could work, and with the cooperation of the community, diseases could be contained within a certain area. The quick disposal of bodies and the vinegar used to handle the coins were two other factors that have continued to some degree or another. Sterilization has now become common practice, while speedy burials have been pivotal in bringing an end to recent Ebola outbreaks. The story of Eam and its valiant last stand has an almost mythical poeticness to it. Some argue that events have been embellished to create a noble story of self-sacrifice that we should all follow. And like any history that's several centuries old, there's no way to know for certain. But few would claim that the story is untrue. This kind of tale is ripe for seasoning, as the most dramatic and heroic normally are. Yet it remains an iconic story, and one that is now more pertinent than ever. In the words of Victorian local historian William Wood, let all who tread the green fields of Eam remember with feelings of awe and veneration that beneath their feet repose the ashes of those moral heroes who, with a sublime, heroic, and unparalleled resolution, gave up their lives, yet doomed themselves to pristinial death to save the surrounding country. Wow, guys, that was a little bit heavy, but uh, that's amazing. So these it, these people in this village, I don't know, it was around 300 people. They met and decided that they were going to, this is a time before there was, you know, you know, the, the medical interventions we have today, you know, you know, antibiotics and, uh, you know, different sorts of medications and, you know, masks and gloves and you know, all the other stuff. Before any of that, you know, really the only choice you would have had is to stay away from others, generally speaking, right? And they chose to actually lock their entire town, lock themselves away. Like, they chose to do that. When they when they personally, at the beginning of this, uh, most of them didn't have any issues, and they chose to lock themselves down with people that were already sick and, and instead of like, wow, wow. Instead of risking people in other villages, that's that's amazing, man.
I never I've never heard of this story, but it's a beautiful story. I mean, you know, is uh, you know, if it I can definitely say those people that chose to do that, yeah, I mean, I mean, how could you not say they were heroes of some type, moral heroes heroes as uh that that uh what was that? A poem he was reading at the end here, uh, or a, uh, a quote? Uh, it said moral heroes. Yeah, right here. It, I would say they were moral heroes. I mean, you choose to lock yourself into a town where you know there's a very high likelihood that that it's going to end up in death for you and your loved ones. Just and you're doing that specifically to save people that you don't know outside of your town. That's crazy, man. Wow. I'm glad I watched this video. That's definitely a story I, I'm glad I now know. Um, I'd really like to visit that town. How, how do you pronounce it? I was pronouncing it Eam. I can't, I don't know if he was saying Eam or is it Eam. But either way, I, I definitely want to uh, explore that town at some point. That would be very interesting now that I know the story to kind of possibly see some of those graves and, you know, just, I don't know. It'd be. Once you know a story like this, it's just always really interesting when you finally get to explore the place of the story you've heard, of a true story uh, that you've heard. But yeah, guys, this was this was really interesting. Um, thank you so much for stopping by. Please click that like button. Feel free to drop your comments or suggestions about this video or others. And especially if you have anything similar to this, I really enjoyed this. So if you know of any other similar stories, to this, please feel free to leave them in the comments and uh, definitely enjoy checking those out. Uh, but yeah, guys, uh, please hit that subscribe button to continue to follow me on my journey to discover my British and Irish ancestry. Until next time, guys, peace.